Mr. Commissioner, uh, thank you very much for a uh, comprehensive and, uh, and very candid appraisal. Um, you are probably the closest thing to Alexander Hamilton that we have in Europe today. Uh, we don't wish you any of the same uh, results that he suffered after his uh, famous duel, but uh, we wish you the best in uh, promoting the kind of federation that, uh, that he did here. Uh, let me start by going back to your very uh, thoughtful and comprehensive uh, description of the European economic outlook. And uh, I will confess to being one of those American economists who thinks that a little more aggressive macroeconomic policy might now be in order. Um, you mentioned, quite rightly, that fiscal consolidation was necessary even in the countries that are now under no bond market pressure. And you made analogies with the United States. But surely the timing of that fiscal consolidation uh, should be reviewed at this point in time. It's what we're doing here. The clear view is that the U.S. needs substantial fiscal consolidation, but it should be phased in over time to avoid dampening the possible recovery. Um, why is the same thing not true for Germany, Holland, Austria, the several key parts of your economy in Europe, which are under no pressure from the bond markets? Uh, you mentioned the interest rates very low in the United States, yes, but they're even lower in Germany. So why is the Commission not more aggressively promoting? Why are the authorities in those countries themselves not taking that opportunity to delay the implementation of fiscal tightening, not just let the stabilizers take effect, which you mentioned, but rather take more discretionary measures now to try to avoid the risk of a double dip, avoid the risk of an actual turndown, and provide a stronger macroeconomic foundation for dealing with the financial and debt crises that you described so clearly. Thanks for the question, Fred. Uh, it's, of course, uh, extremely pertinent one uh, in the current uh, context. Uh, and uh, in this regard, uh, I believe uh, we have to see what are the origins, uh, what are the real root causes of the current uh, uncertainty in the markets uh, and uh, the recent uh, uh, weakening of uh, business and uh, consumer confidence. And uh, our view is that uh, in Europe, uh, this is uh, in the first place uh, related uh, to the sovereign debt crisis uh, and uh, the related uh, banking sector fragilities. And we have seen that uh, some banks, uh, actually a number of banks uh, have lost uh, significantly in terms of uh, share value in the past couple of uh, weeks and uh, months. Uh, and we have seen that uh, there are, there are problems in uh, interbank lending in Europe, uh, and uh, this is reflected uh, already as regards uh, the channeling of uh, credit uh, to enterprises uh, and uh, households. So our analysis is that, uh, in fact, uh, the nature of the crisis uh, for the moment uh, is uh, less uh, related uh, to the, say, uh, macroeconomic stability <coughs> Overall, in fact, uh, in many ways, uh, the economic fundamentals uh, of Europe are strong. And as we saw in the first half of this year, we had uh, very robust uh, economic uh, growth, uh, both thanks to export growth uh, and also significant rebalancing uh, towards uh, domestic demand. So in fact, uh, the uh, underlying state of the European economies uh, most of the European economies, uh, especially in Central and uh, Northern Europe, uh, is uh, healthy and uh, rather resilient. And therefore, we see that uh, it's essential that uh, we take a more, say, surgical approach, uh, targeting those problems uh, that are currently weakening confidence. Uh, and that's why the issue of uh, both uh, restoring fiscal sustainability, not only in the program countries, but uh, in other vulnerable countries uh, like Italy, is uh, so crucial and uh, critical for restoring confidence and uh, overcoming the uncertainty. And that's why it is uh, 
essential that uh, we continue to work uh, in order to ensure a sufficient uh, recapitalization of uh, European uh, banks. Uh, in this regard, uh, we do not share the numbers of the IMF uh, which have been published uh, uh, today and uh, leaked uh, three weeks ago, but uh, we share the same concern and uh, I can just say that uh, that is a work in progress. Uh, we are working in order to ensure recapitalization of uh, European banks. Uh, just to press it maybe one step further, uh, I think you will find no disagreement here about the need to do all the things you just said, targeting the financial system, the stability issues that you raised. But I guess we can't get out of our heads the thought that all that could proceed more smoothly with greater probability of success if the economic growth that you rightly mentioned was robust in the first half of this year, but has now dropped rather sharply, and you mentioned that, if that could be reinforced over the next year or two. Um, and I don't ask you to comment so much on specific countries, that's delicate, but, <laughs> but why not a delay of the fiscal consolidation plans in Germany, in the United Kingdom, which also along with the U.S. and Germany, has seen its long-term interest rates driven down to very low levels in the current uh, crisis and has uh, um, very uh, uh, little risk itself of financial instability. Uh, why shouldn't those stronger economies play a, a more aggressive role in trying to improve the framework within which the undoubted consolidation and austerity as well as structural reform is needed in the program countries. That's a tough one, especially for somebody who has uh, read his case. Uh, and uh, I could come out of the cupboard uh, in 2009 after 20 years of uh, quite a challenging period. Uh, so uh, as a closet case, and it was uh, quite, uh, say, uh, revitalizing to be able to support uh, all the <laughs> fiscal stimulus and monetary stimulus measures uh, over of the uh, autumn of 2008 and uh, early 2009, which uh, to a large extent uh, worked uh, on both sides of the Atlantic and uh, were crucial for the restoring of uh, confidence uh, and uh, growth uh, in, the world, uh, in the world economy. But here I think uh, we have to go actually, I have to make a confession that uh, it's related to the political structure of, uh, of Europe. If you compare the United States uh, and Europe uh, in this regard. Uh, you can say that uh, the US is uh, it's like, a, like an aircraft uh, carrier which uh, can uh, nevertheless uh, with uh, large impact uh, move relatively in a unified manner and even relatively fast uh, in uh, making economic policy decisions uh, having uh, the US, US government and uh, the Fed uh, as uh, the two poles, uh, not to forget the Congress, but uh, having having, say, two main poles of uh, policymakers, uh, while in Europe uh, we are rather a convoy of uh, 27 <coughs> ships uh, in the Eurozone, a convoy of uh, 17 ships, uh, and it is always uh, much harder to turn this uh, convoy to one single direction or even in a coordinated uh, direction uh, than it is uh, to turn this uh, one single uh, substantial aircraft carrier to, to one direction. And uh, that's why, as uh, we are not yet sure how serious uh, an economic slowdown we are going to face uh, in the coming months, uh, we see that uh, it is uh, better to maintain consistency, not least uh, because, and I referred to what I said earlier, our analysis is that uh, this current state of the, states of the crisis, uh, the sovereign banking crisis, uh, is uh, mostly related to the loss of confidence uh, because of the sovereign problems uh, and the uh, banking sector uh, fragilities. Um, let me turn, if I might, to uh, one of the structural and institutional questions you addressed and then open up the discussion to the audience. Um, you talked, I think, quite rightly and with some pride about the creation <laughs> of the European Financial Support Facility and how it will play a central role in responding to the crisis. Um, and you mentioned the need 
and the movement toward increased flexibilities in its use and how that will be evolving over the future. Um, let me ask two related questions, and I fully recognize this is a delicate period as the individual parliaments in the member countries are getting ready to ratify the EFSF. One does not want to uh, rock the boat too much with, uh, uh, with uh, even more ambitious plans for using it. But let me ask two questions about it. One, about its magnitude. Will it be desirable, in your view, to expand the potential magnitude of the EFSF to provide for possible problems in bigger economies like Italy and Spain, perhaps by working out cooperative arrangements with the European Central Bank that would enable the capital in the EFSF itself to be leveraged in the normal way, in the way that the Fed and the Treasury did in this country uh, when we were responding to our crisis two or three years ago. Uh, ideas have been developed, as you well know, to magnify the potential firepower of the EFSF through arrangements with the ECB. And any comments that you would care to make on that topic, I think, would be extremely helpful in, uh, in uh, inspiring confidence that the amount of ammunition will be adequate to deal with possible contingencies. And secondly, um, you mentioned, and many of us here are very encouraged by that, uh, your own project to develop a blueprint for euro bonds to report to the European Parliament, talk about that over the next few months. Should we view the EFSF and the kind of successful financing that it arranged yesterday that you mentioned, should we view that as a first step in the direction of creating euro bonds, which over time uh, will be a major institutional uh, 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 innovation and which will form the basis, presumably, of the economic part of economic and monetary union, which until now has not been complete. As regards uh, the creation of the European Financial Stability Facility, I want to tell you one, uh, one fact uh, which, uh, in fact, uh, relates to both of these, uh, these questions, uh, which has not been usually recognized, uh, and this is that uh, when we had the crisis meeting, uh, one of the early, early crisis meetings uh, in uh, spring 2010, that was uh, just after the Greek package uh, on the 2nd of uh, May, and this meeting took place on the 9th of May, very appropriately, the Schumann Day, uh, the Europe, Europe Day in Europe. Uh, and it lasted until the morning of uh, the 10th, uh, and we finished uh, just before the Asian markets uh, opened uh, and went uh, straight to the press conference uh, a few minutes after the Asian markets uh, had, uh, had opened uh, that night. Uh, that day, that Sunday, or the 9th of uh, May, the Commission, in its meeting, made a proposal to create uh, one European financial stability mechanism based, uh, first of all, on the available reserves in the EU budget uh, which guarantees uh, up to 60 billion euros, uh, and then uh, when going beyond that, uh, using uh, member state guarantees as uh, joint and uh, several guarantees. Under the very same umbrella, under one, one arrangement uh, based on qualified majority voting. What was the result? Uh, we got the first part, uh, the 60 billion euro, which became the current uh, community instrument, uh, the European financial stability mechanism. But uh, the second part, uh, the extension, was uh, rejected uh, by member states uh, on the other side of the road uh, because I moved from the Commission meeting uh, over Rue de la Loire to the other, other side, uh, to the Council meeting, and there this was rejected uh, by, by member states. Uh, and instead of that, uh, we had to improvise uh, overnight uh, and create uh, this uh, special purpose vehicle, which uh, later on became known as the European Financial Stability Facility, <coughs> which is based on uh, pro rata guarantees, uh, each member state guarantees on its own, instead of uh, joint and several guarantees. Why were we rejected? Uh, because uh, for several member states, uh, these uh, joint and several guarantees uh, resembled uh, euro bonds, uh, and uh, they flatly said, uh, no way. I'm not saying that uh, which would have been better in terms of uh, 
firefighting and in terms of uh, containing conta contagion and uh, putting putting down the fires of, uh, of the crisis. Uh, but uh, we already then proposed uh, a solution which uh, in fact uh, resembled uh, uh, in many ways uh, uh, the Eurobonds. As regards the size uh, we proposed uh, already in uh, December, January to increase the size uh, of the EFSF uh, to the current level which uh, is now the decision. Uh, Commission President uh, Barroso was heavily criticized uh, because of that uh, by some member state leaders. Uh, in March there was some crumbling about that uh, and uh, in July that was decided. So um, yes, uh, we see that uh, we have to ensure that uh, we have the sufficient uh, magnitude uh, and the necessary flexibility for the EFSF uh, to operate uh, effectively and uh, here interventions in the secondary markets uh, are critical having the possibility of uh, having uh, precautionary credit lines uh, like the IMF uh, is critical and uh, also under certain conditions uh, also the recapitalization of, uh, of uh, financial institutions uh, is uh, a possibility. Maybe this responds uh, to your question at this stage uh, as you said yourself uh, there are critical votes taking place uh, in these very days uh, Next week, for instance, uh, the Bundestag will vote on this uh, on the 29th of uh, September and uh, some other parliaments uh, in late September, early October. And I expect that uh, we would have this uh, reformed uh, EFSF uh, operational and uh, fully functional towards uh, the second half of uh, October, which is very important uh, for our resources and, uh, and uh, abilities to, to contain uh, the currently ongoing contagion effect. Okay, we'll open it to the floor. Uh, Kyle Kochweiser. Please uh, announce yourself, tell you where you're from, and then fire away. Uh, Kyle Kochweiser, uh, Deutsche Bank. Uh, Oli, there are two hot topics that you did not really elaborate on. Uh, one is Italy, and the other one is the ECB. And I know the constraints you have <laughs> from my experience in commenting on ECB uh, policy. But under the general heading of too little, too late, first on Italy, if you say, and I agree with you, that uh, uh, Ireland is turning the corner, that the Portuguese program of Passos Coelho is basically on track, uh, of, and Zapatero Roman II begins to work better than what they did initially and might be continued even if the opposition wins after the elections, of course, the markets have turned attention now to Italy, which is a completely different size. Um, and I wonder whether you could elaborate a bit on how you see the policy challenges, the credibility of uh, implementation, and particularly this uh, size issue, because that links back to the point uh, Fred also alluded to, the FSF has the firepower to deal with the smaller countries, but at least timing-wise, there would be a constraint in the downside scenario to deal with Italy. <coughs> And perhaps also in Italy, where political culture has such an important role. We have seen it after the introduction of the euro, the enormous drop in interest rates, but the party continued. Structural reforms basically didn't happen. And my skepticism is, and you might want to comment that on the Italian example, is if you move in the direction of euro bonds and in, in those directions, the party might still continue because there would be another relief. How to, uh, to get the right equilibrium between forcing change and uh, not giving relief to, to early. Not to be long, but just quickly on my second question, which relates to what Fred already alluded to, a timing question on the EFSF reform and the size. And if you could comment a bit where the necessity might not dictate the ECB to indeed go into areas like um, Fred alluded to, I mean, whether it's uh, making the FSF, giving it the banking license, allowing other things, I mean, this. <coughs> difficult relationship which of course is so contentious with the Germans and others on what the ECB can do if timing is so vital. Thank you. Very uh, comprehensive questions uh, but uh, very critical ones uh, as regards uh, the near future of uh, the Eurozone. And uh, first of all not to forget uh, and what I tried to say in my opening remarks uh, is that uh, my view is that uh, before we can uh, even seriously contemplate uh, any kind of uh, Eurobonds uh, alternative, we need to substantially reinforce uh, 
economic and fiscal surveillance uh, in the European Union, precisely to avoid that uh, the party goes on and uh, we would have then, uh, then uh, joint and several uh, guaranteed uh, eurobonds. Uh, that would uh, be a, uh, a receipt of uh, failure and uh, it would mean that uh, eurobonds would, uh, would uh, indeed uh, turn to junk bonds uh, and uh, we, you know what, we do not want that to happen. As regards uh, Italy, Italy has, uh, I mean, uh, it's always the challenge of uh, painting a, uh, say, uh, correct and fair picture, but uh, in, in terms of uh, half full and uh, half empty. I would say that uh, when Italy was hit uh, by market pressures, uh, its uh, economic fundamentals uh, had not really changed at all. I mean, it had uh, for some time already, thanks to the work done by Finance Minister Giulio Tremonti and uh, decisions uh, taken by the government and parliament, uh, it had actually a very sensible and uh, rigorous uh, line in, uh, in fiscal policy, which actually relates also to Fred's uh, concerns uh, early on, in a sense that uh, it was not, uh, say, excessively aggressively uh, uh, cutting and, uh, and uh, pursuing austerity, austerity measures. But uh, nevertheless, it was a, a solid line meeting the medium-term fiscal targets uh, and uh, achieving, uh, achieving fiscal balance uh, in, a, in a few years, balanced budget uh, in, a, in a few years' time. Then uh, the more systemic uh, contagion started to spread uh, because of uh, uncertainty and uh, weakening of confidence. Uh, and uh, Italy was, uh, with, with Spain, uh, first, uh, first in line. And in that context, uh, Italy took, uh, in early August, uh, some important uh, decisions, uh, for instance, uh, advancing its uh, target of uh, reaching a balanced budget uh, in 2013 and uh, substantiating that with uh, concrete measures uh, which were voted in the parliament uh, during the summer recess. The parliament uh, worked through the summer recess uh, in, in Rome and uh, took uh, very important uh, decisions uh, in this regard. So I would say that uh, in terms of uh, fiscal policy as such, uh, for the moment, uh, it is very difficult to demand uh, more from Italy, while uh, at the same time uh, it would be extremely important that uh, Italy will uh, take uh, further decisions uh, on structural reforms uh, to boost uh, economic growth uh, and uh, job creation in the, in the country. There is a need of uh, broad liberalization of the economy, of uh, opening up uh, closed uh, professions, uh, reforming the local administration uh, as well as reforming the judicial system so that uh, all the growth potential which exists uh, in Italy can be tapped. And that's the big challenge for, for Italy for the, for the moment, uh, apart from the political challenges uh, which I prefer not to, not to comment uh, too much at, uh, at this stage. On the ECB, you're right, Kaya, better that uh, the ECB and uh, Jean-Claude Tichet comment uh, the ECB business, otherwise I will receive a phone call in half an hour Unless he's in the plane, maybe I'll be, I'll be saved uh, for a few hours. Uh, so so uh, I just uh, can say that uh, the ECB has played uh, a central role in, uh, in uh, firefighting this uh, crisis in Europe. Uh, it has, uh, in uh, several occasions, uh, also taken the responsibility which uh, uh, would have belonged uh, under ideal circumstances uh, to uh, national governments uh, and uh, its decisions uh, to restart uh, the securities markets program and uh, uh, thus uh, calm down the bond markets uh, in the name of uh, restoring the proper functioning of the monetary policy mechanism uh, has been, uh, have been very, very important indeed. Uh, and uh, while we get uh, the more substantial reforms uh, done, I see that uh, we need uh, both uh, the EFSF and uh, the ECB in the meantime while uh, the medium to long term goal is to transfer these responsibilities uh, from the ECB towards uh, the EFSF uh, and its uh, successor, successors. Anders? <coughs> Anders Holstrom, Peterson Institute. Thank you very much for a very thoughtful and substantial presentation. I, of course, understand that you can't uh, discuss the probability of a Greek default. But I would like to ask you about it's the technicalities about this more or likely event. 
uh, we have all been uh, somewhat frustrated with uh, slow or frustrated uh, or uh, incomplete decision making from time to time from the European uh, Union. Though you also have the cases of early May last year when we saw two quick decisions uh, being made. My question to you is, would the European Union in all its parts be uh, able to uh, handle a Greek default if it would happen so that it, uh, during a weekend so that the, all the necessary decisions are being made in order to contain it so that it does not become disorderly. Thank you. No small talk, uh, apparently. <laughs> I think uh, uh, giving the impression that uh, an orderly restructuring of uh, Greek debt uh, can be done uh, in a kind of uh, neat and uh, tidy way is uh, somewhat illusory to my mind. Uh, and uh, as I said before, we are not uh, seeing uh, a uh, Greek default uh, as a plausible scenario <coughs> and uh, we will not let uh, Greece uh, down to a disorderly default uh, or exit uh, from the euro. You may recall that uh, in the early part of the summer from uh, May until July we had uh, talks with uh, European banks and uh, other banks uh, and uh, more precisely the Greek government uh, negotiated uh, with uh, the International Institute of uh, Finance uh, and they, uh, they agreed uh, a, a deal on private sector involvement uh, which includes uh, both uh, a voluntary rollover of debt uh, and uh, a debt exchange uh, which is backed by credit enhancements uh, from the EFSF. Moreover, as part of this overall package, uh, there, is, uh, there, are, there are provisions uh, for recapitalizing the Greek banks uh, because this will hit Greek banks uh, so as to ensure the resilience of the banking system in Greece uh, and avoid its, uh, its uh, melting down. And uh, there is also provisions for the indemnification of the ECB because it uh, may face losses in this, uh, this context. So, it's a very complicated operation and uh, I would say that uh, this is a voluntary and uh, orderly rearrangement of uh, Greek uh, private uh, debt uh, which is supported uh, by the decisions uh, concerning official loans uh, that is uh, the reduction of the interest rate uh, and uh, the extension of uh, loan maturities uh, that uh, the EU is providing for, for uh, uh, Greece. So as to align this uh, with uh, the programs we have had uh, and we, we still have uh, with uh, Latvia, Romania and we had with, uh, with Hungary, which is uh, under the balance of payments uh, program. Which by the way was uh, to me always an anomaly and uh, very difficult to explain that uh, we had uh, very low kind of uh, cost based uh, interest rates uh, for the countries under the balance of payment program, non-euro area countries, uh, while for euro area countries we had, uh, if not uh, punitive but uh, relatively higher, higher interest rates. Now that's corrected, uh, that's valid for Ireland and Portugal as well, and uh, that's one part of, uh, of uh, improving debt sustainability of, uh, of Greece. And the impact is not uh, insignificant, uh, assuming that uh, this uh, operation of uh, private sector involvement, uh, i.e. the voluntary rollover and uh, debt exchange uh, will, uh, will succeed, uh, as I, I assume, then uh, the the total impact uh, of uh, both uh, the reduction of uh, or the cert certain loss of net present value of uh, private debt uh, and the reduction of rates and extension of maturity so the public debt uh, will be in the scale of 25% uh, uh, of uh, Greek public debt. Uh. So we are now working in order to have all these uh, decisions made uh, and uh, in the EU side uh, we are pretty far the previous Eurogroup last week uh, confirmed the reduction of rates and uh, extension of maturities uh, will continue in the coming weeks uh, and in parallel we work uh, in order to uh, conclude the work related to private sector involvement.
And as I said, uh, of course, this is no default. Uh, this is no hard restructuring, but uh, this is uh, a voluntary and uh, organized uh, rearrangement of uh, Greek uh, public uh, debt. Okay, Uri, and then Mr. Ambassador, and then over here. Thank you. Uh, Uri Dadush with the Carnegie Endowment. Two questions. One is, um, uh, to continue on Italy, uh, a package like the one for Greece, Portugal, or Ireland in Italy would, would be about a trillion euros. Uh, uh, a trillion euros politically is difficult, of course, uh, but economically becomes difficult in the sense that it strains uh, the guarantee lending capacity of the core uh, of the European Union. The question is whether you would envisage, right now the IMF provides a third of financing, you would envisage uh, an IMF involvement in that eventuality as well, and whether it wouldn't ha actually have to be larger uh, than one third uh, from an economic point of view, uh, from economic sustainability point of view. Uh, the s second question, if I may, is um, uh, there is a view, uh, which I happen to share, that uh, the um, uh, issue, main issue in Europe is not fiscal, it's competitiveness. And, uh, uh, or misaligned real exchange rates uh, within the Eurozone. Uh, I'd like to get your view on that. And if indeed the competitiveness issue is very important in this, um, is it actually getting better? Even as we're dealing with the fiscal, do you, do you see uh, the competitiveness issue being corrected among uh, the countries in the periphery? And, uh, or what could be done about it? Thank you. I do not uh, foresee that uh, we would uh, have to resort uh, to a program with uh, Italy, and uh, therefore I am not uh, able nor willing to respond to, to your question as regards uh, any possible IMF uh, share. Uh, in fact, uh, the alternative road uh, is, uh, is already designed in the sense that, uh, first of all, Italy in itself uh, is taking uh, very rigorous decisions uh, on uh, fiscal consolidation and will, will do more in terms of structural reforms related to competitiveness, uh, which is the key in, in the Italian case. Uh, and uh, in parallel to that, uh, we are now doing the reform of the EFSF uh, and uh, giving its uh, powers to intervene in the secondary markets. And uh, when the case is uh, about when the matter is about uh, or the problem, the issue is about uh, liquidity, not about uh, solvency, as uh, clearly is uh, in the Italian case, uh, then uh, these uh, secondary market operations uh, can provide uh, relief uh, with uh, clearly much uh, less uh, cost uh, than uh, a uh, kind of uh, fully, fully fledged uh, program would do. You can see it uh, from the magnitude of uh, of the ECB securities markets uh, program. Uh, it is uh, clearly not in the scale of, uh, of uh, a fully fledged uh, program. If you do it smart, you can do it. You can uh, calm down the markets, uh, provide, uh, provide uh, liquidity through, that, uh, through those, uh, those means. So that's, that's the Italian, uh, Italian road, uh, uh, which has been uh, together with Italy, designed for Italy, and I uh, trust that uh, this, will, uh, this will function. Concerning your second question, uh, definitely yes. Uh, the fundamental problem of, uh, of Europe, uh, which is uh, underlying the certain weaknesses of, uh, of the Economic and Monetary Union, is uh, a clear divergence of uh, competitiveness uh, we have witnessed in the past uh, decade. <coughs> and uh, I recall President Trichet showing uh, the graphs on unit labor costs uh, and their divergence uh, for years uh, in the Eurocop meetings and uh, ECOFIN meetings. Uh, now the message is, is coming across uh, and in fact uh, addressing these uh, macroeconomic imbalances and uh, divergences in competitiveness uh, is uh, one part of the new six-pack uh, reform of uh, economic governance. Uh, we will have uh, 
a sturdier and uh, more significant uh, toolbox uh, for addressing macroeconomic imbalances than, for instance, what G20 is uh, contemplating for the moment. But, uh, of course, the essential thing is what happens uh, on the ground in practice. Uh, and if you take a positive example, Ireland uh, has turned uh, its, co its uh, corner basically because it has been able to start restoring its uh, competitiveness. Uh, and I do not believe only in uh, price competitiveness. I speak also about uh, structural competitiveness, uh, which is uh, more important than that's, uh, say, uh, the receipt of the Nordic countries. Uh, Sanders is here from, uh, from the Red Meitner model to, uh, to the more recent uh, achievements uh, in terms of uh, investing in innovation and, uh, and uh, technology, Restore, restoring and reinforcing uh, real competitiveness. Uh, but of course, uh, Cost competitiveness uh, plays a role, a significant role, and uh, now Greece is following the track of uh, Ireland. Uh, but uh, as Ireland started in 2008, uh, already Greece started in 2010, and it has taken at least uh, three to four years for Ireland uh, to really turn its uh, its uh, page uh, in terms of uh, better competitiveness. On this competitiveness issue, which is critically important. Uh, I, too, have seen President Trichet's charts, and as I remember them, most recently at Jackson Hole a few weeks ago, there were really two significant things about them. One was that the curves for most of the countries were actually very close together, very small differences. The second striking point was that there was one country that was a huge outlier, and that was Germany. Because the German curve was flat or a little bit down over the last 10 years, everybody else was up about 10%, but more or less the same. Now, that leads to different inferences. And I'll maybe look at Kyle as well as you, Mr. Commissioner. Uh, some people argued that Germany came into the EU, to the euro, 10% overvalued. And Germany had to carry out an internal devaluation to get back in, in shape. Well, according to Jean-Claude's charts, it obviously did it, but maybe it overdid it. So that really goes back to the earlier question about maybe the need for Germany to take a little more expansionary policy, even if, horror of horrors, it led to a little bit of erosion of that relative gain over the last 10 years. But as one looks at the Eurozone as a group, that would seem to be the most efficient uh, method to uh, resolve at least part of the competitiveness problem. I'm not uh, sure about that. Uh, and uh, if I may state the reasons for that. Uh, first of all, of course, uh, these uh, charts and uh, curves uh, uh, are, uh, are done uh, so that you have a certain cutoff date. Uh, and uh, it, it makes a difference if you take uh, the year 2000 uh, or the year 1990 yeah, for right. Germany as a cutoff date. Uh, the integration of uh, East Germany to, to West Germany and the unification of Germany was a very costly affair also in terms of uh, price competitiveness uh, and uh, it took quite some effort in the late 1990s, early 2000s uh, for Germany to restore its uh, competitiveness. Second, uh, there are other countries who are very close and especially if you were to take uh, 1990, I think you would have uh, even more close convergence. Uh, you have, uh, Finland, uh, the Netherlands, uh, Austria, Luxembourg, uh, uh, at least uh, Sweden, Sweden uh, outside of the Eurozone, and uh, some other countries uh, who resemble the development of, uh, of uh, Germany. It's rather that uh, in some countries, because of their, or their say, uh, uh, rather corporatist uh, political structures, uh, and in this sense, uh, using a, the word corporate is not as a very positive uh, connotation. And uh, in combination with, uh, with the single interest rate uh, and uh, single monetary policy, you, you had these bubbles so that, uh, that developed. Uh, and uh, that was one of the key reasons why Greece, for instance, uh, lost uh, its uh, cost uh, competitiveness uh, over the past uh, decade. Then there is another issue. It's, uh, which is uh, important. We did uh, a simulation on the Quest model of the Commission. That's our econometric model. And uh, one percent uh, increase in uh, this is uh, I sh my civil servants say that they don't use this publicly because they are kind of uh, 
rule of thumbs and uh, sketches, but uh, let's do it uh, without, uh, without any commitment. Uh, so <laughs> so um, one percent uh, increase, uh, overall increase in wages in Germany would have a, a 0 0.1 percent uh, increase uh, in the GDP of Greece. Why? Because we are in the global economy, first of all, and secondly, because we have an inflation targeting central bank. So uh, you cannot look at uh, only inside the Eurozone economic uh, imbalances. You have to see that uh, Europe is part of the global economy, and uh, we need, uh, in fact, uh, more countries uh, who are able to have a strong export performance, uh, not, uh, not uh, fewer countries. Uh, and uh, in this regard, I agree that uh, it would be important that uh, Germany would uh, do such kind of uh, reforms that uh, enhance uh, structural reforms that uh, enhance uh, domestic demand. Uh, but kind of an overall uh, fiscal stimulus or wage increase uh, would uh, actually in the very short term already be, be quite counterproductive for Germany and for, the Europe, uh, for Europe as a whole. Mr. Ambassador. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, George Sapari, Ambassador of Hungary. I have a question on the six packs. Um, I must admit I've been a great supporter of the six pack, but in honesty, I have some doubt of how, how much more efficient it will be the current SGP arrangement. The six packs have a, a broad debt under the excessive deficit procedure, introduced an excessive macroeconomic imbalances procedure, strengthened the sanction system, strengthened the voting system. That said, the rules are technically so complicated, such as uh, how the, uh, 20, the rule of 20 for the debt reduction, the uh, macroeconomic imbalances and all the, all the consideration that is how you have to uh, react to that, how you interpret it, how you have to react to, react to that. In, so what is your opinion? What part of the six pack would strengthen economic cooperation? Uh, and um, in, in using your words, what is it that it would make the convoy to get to move in the same direction more easily now than before? The six-pack has uh, three main elements. Uh, first, uh, more rigorous uh, uh, fiscal surveillance, uh, both concerning deficit and, uh, as you rightly said, uh, on the debt criterion, which is now for the first time really brought into the, into the surveillance uh, mechanism. Second, uh, it will introduce uh, a mechanism of uh, identifying and uh, correcting macroeconomic uh, imbalances. So the first is fiscal, second is uh, macroeconomic, uh, and the third is uh, a credible enforcement mechanism, uh, i.e. in plain English, uh, sanctions uh, or sanctions regime. And, uh, what will make a difference uh, is the combination of uh, all these uh, three, in a sense that uh, the first, uh, that's uh, fiscal policy, that's pretty quantitative. Uh, it's easy to quantify fiscal deficits. Uh, we have an established uh, methodology for that. Uh, the Eurostat is uh, working very closely together with uh, our services uh, of the Commission. While in the second uh, pillar, macroeconomic imbalances, uh, it is bound to be somewhat more qualitative, even though we have uh, quantitative uh, uh, benchmarks or alert thresholds uh, in that field. But we have possibility of uh, using sanctions in both of these. Uh, and uh, when people say that uh, a sanction of, uh, say, uh, maximum 0.5 uh, half, half percent of GDP is not that significant, uh, I would disagree. It, it is actually significant uh, financially, and uh, much more important, uh, it is a signal to the markets uh, that uh, this country is not uh, uh, on a sustainable path in fiscal policy, so please target that country. So in fact, uh, by, by this rules-based mechanism, uh, you attract uh, market discipline, attention and market discipline, and uh, we shall see from uh, the latest uh, January onwards uh, how it will work. Uh, of course, I should uh, hope that I will not have to use this uh, because everything would be fine. But uh, at the same time, if there is uh, if there is a, a case uh, the case in point or if there is a clear need, uh, I do not hesitate to use it. Uh, and uh, then we will test uh, this uh, sanctions uh, mechanism how it will uh, will work. 
on the macroeconomic side, if I just may, there's, uh, that's related to the previous discussion on, uh, on uh, countries with current account surplus and the deficit. Uh, and uh, here, um, the German finance minister Wolfgang Schäuble likes to use uh, Bayern München as, uh, as an example, but uh, I think that's a bit uh, outdated now. We have to use Barcelona. <laughs> so uh, it is not about uh, if Barcelona and uh, Manchester United are playing, it's not, not about uh, making uh, Barcelona play worse uh, in order to have the same uh, level playing field with Manchester United, uh, but uh, rather to combine the forces, uh, the best aspects of uh, Barcelona and Manchester United and uh, play better as a European team. Kyle, did you want to say something about Germany in this context? Well, I think it leads too far, but I think it was a very, economic history is always interesting. I think the unification and what Germany had to struggle through, going quite high exchange rate-wise, you mentioned, into the euro, transferring 4% of GDP annually to East Germany, transferring somewhere between 0.5 and 1% to the European Union, and of course uh, the, the euro introduction of the Bundesbank. Uh, giving the benefit of its interest rates to Europe uh, led to a situation historically where I think historians at some point will focus on that made on this procrustes bed of regaining competitiveness uh, for amazing uh, feats, which is the wage restraint of European uh, labor unions over many years, amazing actually. And secondly, of course, forced the Schroeder government into Agenda 2010, which I think now turns out to have been quite successful. We then lost the elections, but <laughs> in that sense, others might not want to follow. But I think it's, very, it's a special case in terms of triggered by reunification and many other moves. But obviously, there are some lessons in uh, Jean-Claude Trichet's uh, charts. I would be very interested, Oli, in your question, in one more question. Uh, in a sense, it's a confidence crisis. In a sense, it's a crisis of leadership in Europe. And we have a very complex governance structure, uh, the intergovernmentalist, the integrationist commission parliament, the council, not made better by some appointments, etc. Wouldn't it be time to underpin all what you described uh, with a roadmap where Europe should be in 10, 15 years? The way the fathers did uh, way back in, on many occasions, to find some forum or to find maybe a Wiseman group that really transcends all these struggles and maps out for confidence building as a guide uh, where Europe has also internationally to position itself uh, 15 years from now. Uh, the Lisbon agenda was a flop. Uh, we were all involved, but it was never really taken seriously. It certainly didn't inspire because there's a large communication education part also in such a roadmap <coughs> Is this completely out of question that this cannot happen? Because it is a question of leadership in the end uh, right now. Thank you. It seems that uh, you have had uh, access to some uh, commission uh, internal uh, memoranda <laughs> as you are talking about uh, roadmaps uh, towards uh, stronger economic governance and uh, more growth, growth enhancing uh, policy structures. Uh, I think. Uh, in my view, it's uh, essential that uh, we will have to have this debate uh, rather soon. And uh, the, uh, the European Council of uh, the 17th of uh, October hopefully will uh, kickstart that debate. Uh, it will take uh, probably some, uh, some decisions uh, already in the, in the meeting itself. Uh, but uh, at least as important is that it would uh, begin a process of uh, reflection uh, that would lead to a roadmap uh, towards uh, a better, better and uh, reinforced uh, economic governance uh, in the European Union, especially in the, in the Eurozone. Commission President uh, Barroso will present uh, the Commission's uh, views on this uh, next week uh, on the 29th, 28th or 29th of uh, September in, in Strasbourg. Uh, um, and uh, I would expect that uh, we can uh, say fully concentrate on this debate uh, once we have uh, taken the decisions uh, to implement uh, uh, the conclusions of the Eurozone Summit uh, in, uh, in July. So very important debate and uh, very fascinating period uh, 
in the medium to long term, we just uh, have to survive uh, and sustain the short term. And we will do so. Question over here. Commissioner Ren Sanjeev Joshipura from the Commodity Markets Council. I have uh, two questions for you. My first question is pertaining to Finland's demand for individual loan guarantees for the next tranche of loans to Greece. Um, is that workable within the EU structures and how are other countries reacting? Um, that's my first question. My second question pertains to the ECB and the Fed, not on specific policies because I understand that you prefer not to comment on that, uh, but on the general concept of uh, central bank independence. Um, on both sides of the Atlantic, central banks have come under some criticism and been under fire for, uh, for various issues. Uh, here in the US, uh, both the right and the left in Congress are demanding increased transparency and uh, you know, a further auditing of the central bank's balance sheets. Uh, we have the left saying that, in Congress again, saying that uh, the central bank's monetary policy tends to be too tight or at least shows a bias towards tightness and the right is saying the opposite. It tends to be too loose, especially right now. And uh, also demanding that uh, uh, the uh, Fed's semi-Keynesian mandate, as you called it, should be changed to make it more akin to that of the ECB. And on the other side of the pond, you have uh, uh, some criticism or some commentary of the ECB in regards to uh, uh, loans, or not loans, excuse me, but uh, investing in bonds of individual countries. Uh, so, you know, uh, my, my question for you there is, what are your thoughts on the comparative uh, uh, perceived threats or potential threats, I guess, to central bank independence on both sides of the Atlantic? Thank you. Thank you. As regards uh, uh, the issue of uh, the collateral issue to which you referred, uh, that has been uh, the demand of uh, the government of Finland, uh, and I am actually seeing that uh, the ambassador of the country I know best is, uh, is here, so I'm speaking under her control and, uh, and I'm just uh, observing the, the uh, discussion rather than, rather than uh, anything else. Uh, in my view, it would be very important uh, to solve this uh, collateral issue as soon as uh, possible and uh, get it out of the agenda, as we have uh, such uh, huge challenges for the world economy and the European economy for the moment. I have nothing else to say about that. As regards the ECB um, and uh, Fed uh, independence, uh, I'm not uh, sufficiently familiar with, uh, with the US uh, debate that I would uh, feel competent in, uh, in commenting that uh, in front of this uh, audience. Uh, I can say that uh, in Europe, uh, the European Central Bank uh, has uh, a uh, very strong, uh, uh, very strong uh, legitimacy and uh, degree of uh, independence, uh, which, uh, as a principle, is not uh, challenged uh, really in in Europe by any of the political uh, forces uh, or any any quarters. Uh, perhaps I should add that uh, there is uh, a. Uh, rather intensive uh, debate in Germany going on uh, in some other countries as well on some of the issues uh, you referred to. But uh, I believe that uh, no one is, uh, is uh, seriously challenging uh, the independence of the ECB and, uh, and overall the ECB enjoys uh, very high legitimacy among uh, the European uh, institutions. Mr. Commissioner, you've been very generous with your time. You've been very candid and comprehensive in your remarks. We thank you very much for joining us. We wish you the best of success in dealing with this whole range of difficult and critical problems. And we look forward to staying in close touch. Thank you very much. Thank you.